But tonight is, of course, unfortunately, too many preachers are preaching other people's sermons. And so if, you, if one of the things you take away from tonight is preach your own sermons. Well, thank you. It is a great joy to be here, to be with my very dear friends with whom I have traveled the world Garrick and Rick, and we have we have seen the sights, and and uh, I have to finish telling the story of uh, my my taking a stand in in the Academy of Homiletics for persuasion, and uh, that year, um, Dr. Richard Lisher, who is the professor of homiletics uh, uh, at Duke University uh, Divinity School, was the rising president. So he uh, gave a uh, the the sermon that the rising president uh, delivers. Now he was a one of the non-persuasion uh, side, and. Um, as he was finishing his sermon and the service was over and he was walking through the uh, service, uh, Dr. Jean Lowry, uh, uh, a homiletician, put his arm around Rick and said, Rick, that sermon was very persuasive. <laughs> Now, uh, after that, I had written a, a, a paper on rethinking persuasion, and I invited uh, Dr. Lisher to respond to me in a in the homiletic journal. And I never uh, have have decided. I've never been able to figure out whether he intended the irony, but my article was rethinking persuasion, and his was why I am not persuasive. <laughs> Well, I, I feel I need to make a Benedictine connection before I begin to talk about rhetoric. And that is that my husband, Kevin Patrick Francis Hogan, uh, his cousin was actually, I believe, a seminarian here and eventually became the abbot at your, sem your uh, the monastery in um, Illinois, uh, Abbot Mark Hogan was um, our family member. And uh, I, I just feel I have to tell one more story. Will you let me tell one more story? Our, our nephew, Timothy, and a friend in the mid-'80s had decided to take his uh, old Beetle car, uh, which he still has, and they live in Winnipeg, they uh, decided to drive from Winnipeg to uh, Central America, where Father Abbot Mark was back in uh, Guatemala. So they drove down through Mexico and arrived at the monastery and uh, knocked on the door. A woman came to the door, and they said they were there to see Father Mark. And she let them in and took them into uh, a room, and there was a casket there. And... They looked at each other, he and his friend, and the woman came back and they said, I think you misunderstood. We're here to see Father Mark. And she looked at them and said, so he had just died just before they got there. So that is quite a family story. Well, this evening, I would like us to reflect on the challenging times in which we find ourselves preaching. How fortunate that we have been called for such a time as this. We preach in an interesting landscape. For you, and I think a real contribution to the church now is the uh, movement of the new evangelization that, that is coming out of the Vatican. But for many of us, they are preaching to people who, uh, and I will talk about later, Kenda Dean calls the almost 
Christians the, that turn to moralist therapeutic deism, or the conservative evangelicals that are uh, shaping what many view as what is Christianity today, or postmodern indifference, and all the way to the venomous atheism that, that people are reading. Such a time as this. I was uh, quite dismayed recently when I went on the website of the United Methodist Church called Ministry Matters. Now, I'm ordained in the Episcopal Church, but I teach at a Methodist seminary in Washington, D.C., and I decide I do keep up with that. And there was a blog that had been posted by one of the people who writes for the website and puts together service, the, the weekly Sunday service resources. And the title of the article was Reasons Not to Write Sermons from Scratch. He said, I cannot imagine why pastors put themselves through such an ordeal week after week. He, said, he record, recounted how uh, they were going to be doing a um, service for the people that, were, that work at the center where they put together the website. And he was just so busy that he went to the website and found a sermon that they had published at some point. And he said, I took it. And I changed a few sermons and or stories, and I tweaked it a little bit. And he said, I didn't invest a ridiculous amount of time preparing it. There are better ways, he wrote, for pastors to spend their time. There's more to being a pastor than preaching. This was on an official church website. So my question is, where do you begin? Well, to help us navigate through this rough terrain of where we find ourselves, I would like to bring back some voices from the great cloud of witnesses, namely Aristotle and Cicero and St. Augustine, as well as turning to some contemporary voices in rhetoric and communication studies. My goals this evening are straightforward. First, to remind you that you have been called by God to preach. You have been called to go and tell. You are crucial. Second, that our preaching is crucial. Crucial to the life and the growth and the future of the church it is crucial in the lives of the people to whom we have been sent to serve. And finally, that learning, improving, deepening our preaching is a lifelong pursuit. <clears throat> when I am asked what I do, and I tell strangers or new acquaintances acquaintances that I teach preaching, more often than not, the response goes something like this. Really? Can you do that? <laughs> now, I think behind that is the perception that if you are called by God, if you are ordained, then somehow those sermons just come to you out of the air. That the, you are inspired by God, you don't have to work on them, you just, they just come to you. Now, I have to confess that I do get some students uh, every year who still do believe that. But I do think you can learn to be better preachers and that, that we can improve and deepen our preaching. I do think that I can teach people to preach. Now, before we get to talking about ethos and pathos and logos, I want us to first make my first point, to remind us 
that we have been called to go and tell. Early on a spring morning in the middle of Pesach, a woman wound her way for her final act to a dear friend and her teacher. We don't know if she was alone. Some of the Gospels say she was with a few people, just one other person. But whether, however many people there were, she went to that tomb and it was empty. Now, she didn't know what to make of it. She, of course, looked inside and there were people. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? And then she turned around and there was a man. She thought he was the gardener. Now, I, th I think that John is making a theological statement here because she is in the garden. This is a new creation. It is the gardener. And what does that gardener tell her to do? Go to my brothers and say to them, Mary, the apostle to the apostles, the first Christian preacher. And she joined a long line of tellers. Go and tell. Moses and Aaron were sent to tell the children of Israel, God has heard your cries. God will lead you out. Go tell old Pharaoh. Let my people go. Go and tell. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, go and tell. Thus says the Lord. So Mary joined that long line of tellers. Did she run back? Did she stumble back to her friends sent by Jesus? Go and tell with her new message. I have seen the Lord. So you and I stand in this long line of tellers sent with the good news, I have seen the Lord. But what about our time, our world? Well, like Moses and Aaron, we are still worried about Egypt. Like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos, we are still concerned about the Middle East. And what about the church? In a recent article in America, Edward McCormick from the Washington Theological Union raised up Pew Research Forum data. One in 10 Americans is a former Catholic. For every one person entering our CIA, four leave. 71% of the people who left the Catholic Church for the Protestant Church said their spiritual needs were not being met. And many who left said the church focused too much on rules and money and power. But enough about you. What about me? What about the Episcopal Church? Are any of those 71% streaming our way? Wouldn't seem like it. Between 1991 and 2001, the Episcopal Church declined by 6%. In 1991, our population was 2.5 million. Between 2001 and 2012, our population, our Percentage, the percentage of the Episcopal Church declined by 16%. In 2010, we were down to 1.9 million, and our attendance has dropped by 23%. Today, 60% of Episcopal clergy, 60%, are over the age of 55. 
Russ Duthout writing in the New York Times in July during the time when the Episcopal Church was meeting in general convention in Indianapolis, he asked, can liberal Christianity be saved? He wrote, they are flexible to the point of indifference on dogma, friendly to sexual liberation in almost every form, willing to blend Christianity with other faiths, and eager to downplay theology entirely in favor of sec secular political causes. Go and tell. Is there hope? I appreciate Pope John Paul and Pope Benedict's challenge for the new evangelization. Before we reach out to others, we have to re-evangelize ourselves and this great relaunching of a new in ardor and methods and expression to renew a living sense of the faith. McCormick in the article I mentioned earlier wrote that in a world filled with bad news and shallow entertainments people long for good news that means something. This good news is found in the story told by the New Testament writers. If the new evangelization is to succeed, the church must recover this story and share it with the world. And he goes on to write about a change in direction. Rather than thinking that we are here just waiting until we can get to heaven, he wants to remind us that the New Testament writers are talking about heaven come to earth, the inbreaking of God's new creation, reorienting our imagination and as Mary Catherine Hilkert writes, that as preachers, we are naming grace. Where is God's grace breaking in and filling our world? McCormick continues, Christianity is a way of life coming from the future into the present, energized by the Holy Spirit and formed by the values of God's new creation. This new kind of creation, he writes, motivates us to resist all that is opposed to God's new creation. It compels us to share the good news with others. And to that I say, amen and alleluia. But why am I including this in an article on, or a discussion of rhetoric? Because he closes his article with this call. This entire discussion, however, depends on good preaching. Without an all-out effort to renew preaching, the new evangelization will be dead on arrival. When preaching is done well, he writes, the Christian faith becomes infectious. Or as Anglican writer Evelyn Underhill wrote a century ago, we must all be contagious Christians. McCormick says, there must be a massive overhaul of the practice of preaching. And to that I say, amen and alleluia. So we have been called to go and tell. But how? A few years ago, a young student made an appointment to come and speak with me. Now, she was from Korea, and I was guessing that she was a little nervous that she was going to be having, having to preach her sermons soon in class and that she was uncomfortable with speaking in English. I was wrong. She sat in my office, and she looked at me, and she said, shouldn't we give up preaching isn't it outdated? She said, you know, I noticed that in my youth group, I get a lot more attention if I show a film clip. Shouldn't we just be showing film clips? I have to confess, I was a little shocked. And it got me thinking. But I believe preaching is crucial. Preaching is crucial to the life of the church, even in 2012. As St. Paul said, how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom, 
of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. William Byron and Charles Zeck did a study for the Diocese of Trenton to look why non-church-going Catholics were non-church-going Catholics. I stopped going regularly, said one person, because the homilies were so empty. Many of the com complaints they found were about homilies and music. I would, that's a different talk. I don't get that one. <laughs> I don't know. If you heard, had to hear some of the stuff I hear at the Methodist Seminary, it makes me want to go back to the Catholic Church. <laughs> And, and I just have to tell you, when you began Pange Lingua, oh, I went to the Holy Land in April. Some dear, dear friends. Uh, he was my dean for many years, and his wife and my husband and I went to college together, so that you can tell how long we've known them. And they, she's a Methodist pastor, and they were taking her church group to the Holy Land so it was interesting to see it through uh, Methodist eyes. They loved the Galilee. They loved up in the rural areas. Now, then when we got to Jerusalem, I thought, now, yes. But we sang all those praise songs that only have about five words as we would go on the bus. So when we, when we got to the shrine of the Holy Sepulcher, I hummed Pange Lingua the whole time I was there. <laughs> In their study, one person said, I would advise the bishop to make training in public speaking mandatory for every priest. They should also be trained in how to relate their homilies to the people and inspire them. Amen and alleluia. Preaching is crucial. Ronald Allen and a group of homileticians put together a study also of listening to listeners uh, what, what do listeners think about preaching and what do they hear? In one of their introductions of the four books in that series, they wrote, our research has continued to support the belief that preaching is important in the lives of believers and congregations. Those who sit in the pews week after week show they are eager for a significant and timely word to feed their faith and their witness. And they are continuing to come to worship because they are believing in preaching. When I was reading, writing my uh, introduction to preaching book, Graceful Speech, shameless plug, uh, I, a message that I heard over and over again was that. When I asked clergy, what do they wish that they had learned in preaching class? One of my colleagues in the Episcopal Diocese of Washington quite literally got nose to nose with me. And he said, tell them that people are listening. <laughs> tell them that people are listening. Preaching is crucial to the life of the faithful and the life of the church. Well, we can add images and we can add film clips but in the end, it is the preacher, the preacher's love and commitment, the preacher's study and reflection, the preacher's thoughts and words. An important dimension, therefore, of new evangelization is to reawaken the faith and the personal renewal of people in the congregation. But I think that it also needs to awaken the faith and the renewal of the preachers. McCorry Cormick wrote that according to a friend, Catholics are often homily hostages. <laughs> now one such homily hostage about 1,500 years ago was Augustine. And he helped us to see that preaching was central to our mission, but he also helped us to understand that we are always to be about the, listen, the business of learning and improving and deepening our preaching and how to do that. <laughs> 
So I want to turn back to that great cloud of witnesses and talk about rhetoric. Yes, Rick is right. Rhetoric is often a bad word. Now, in my household, when my children were still at home, they would as soon as someone would say, well, that's just rhetoric, they would turn to watch their mother, who would then promptly say, it's all rhetoric, all the way down. So let me give you just a little background. Before we get to Augustine, to appreciate what he was trying to do, we have to think about those two strands that were fighting. And we see that so beautifully in Tertullian's beautifully rhetorically crafted statement, what does Athens have to say to Jerusalem? Well, what did Athens have to say to Jerusalem? So you have these two worlds. You had the Jewish world, the Jewish world with its understanding of rev revelation and epistemology and proclamation. And you had Athens, you had the Gentile world, the philosophical world, and its understanding of how we speak and how we come to speak. These two worlds in the early church were constantly battling constantly battling. Well, in, in, the, in the, uh, the Jewish world, there was the school of the prophets. People did go and learn how to speak. But there was the understanding, the perception, that when God called you, God also gave you the words, and that's what you did. And then, of course, we have Aristotle. We have Plato, we have Aristotle, and if we go all the way back to Corex and Titius, we have the sense that you can teach people how to speak. So what did Aristotle say? Now, when I was in graduate school and working on my PhD, we would have these long discussions about Gadamer and Habermas and Foucault and all the, the, Europe, the continental philosophers and what they were all talking about. And then we would come to the end of the class and my, my, one of my professors laughed and he said, all right, now you're all going to leave this class and go to the next room to teach public speaking 101. And he said, and what are you going to teach? You're going to teach Aristotle. Nothing had changed. Well, what did Aristotle say? So let's talk about ethos and pathos and logos. Ethos, who is the speaker? Make no mistake, every time you get up in front of a congregation, they want to know, who are you? It doesn't matter if you have a stole on. It doesn't matter if you have the reverend or the right reverend or doctor. They want to know, do you know what you're talking about? Do you care about them? And are you going to make sense? And they ask that every time. Ethos. Make no mistake also, tomorrow night at the debates, that's what people will be watching for. Does this person care about me? Does this person know what he's talking about? Is this the person I should elect as president? Logos, the words you choose, the arguments you put together. Are, does, is it clear? Can we follow you? And pathos, the, the sense that I am going to care about this and that I need to know my listeners. Again, tomorrow night, they're going to have to craft their messages for a very diverse audience. How do they reach all those various constituencies? Pathos. Or as Ron Allen says in one of his books, hearing the sermon talks about them as relationship, content, 
and feeling. So, in the Athens world, if one was going to be successful, one had to be a speaker. There were no lawyers. If you had a case in the court, you had to go argue it yourself. That's how rhetoric came to be, because they went to the court and watched, and watched who, what did those who won their cases, cases do, and what did those who did not win, what did they fail to do? So th there is a strategic way to use words to think about crafting a message for listeners in the hopes of moving and persuading. Now, rhetoric also helped us to understand what we're doing. Well, invention, gathering our arguments, arrangement, lining them up, style, which words to choose, what level, are, am I going to be uh, very flowery or am I going to be a plain speaker, memory and delivery. Now, what happened was then the church fathers rejected this. They wanted inspiration, not perspiration. They, as soon as they became Christians, they left rhetoric behind. But of course, the reality is they didn't. It, rhetoric is like riding a bicycle. Once you know how to do it, you can't not do it. And there's a reason, therefore, that we read all the church fathers, because they knew how to put together an argument, and they knew how to persuade, and they knew how to ask questions, what does Athens have to say to Jerusalem? So Augustine, of course, uh, was a teacher of rhetoric, and much to his mother chagrin, had not really fully embraced her faith. So he goes to uh, Milan to teach rhetoric, and he, go, he begins to go to the sermons and to hear Ambrose preaching. And eventually, of course, he is converted. Now, at that point, he said, he wrote a letter to his employers and said, you're going to have to find someone else to teach your filthy rhetoric. So he em embarked on his career of going and telling and preaching. He rejected rhetoric until many years later when he was a bishop. Now earlier he had written De Doctrina Christiana on how to interpret scriptures. But finally, when he was a bishop, he had to do what bishops do, well, maybe not your bishops, but uh, to go and visit all his parishes and listen to his clergy preach. And that was the point at which he became a homiletic hostage. And we can only imagine the, the night that he got home what late one Sunday after his travels. And he sat there and thought that preacher was horrible. In fact, they're all horrible. What are we going, what am I going to do? Well, he did what all scholars do. He decided to add another chapter to his book. <laughs> and hence we get book four of De Trina Christiana. In the beginning, he says, don't think that this is a Christian rhetoric. But of course, it actually is a Christian rhetoric. And borrowing heavily from Cicero, he says that, you know, our preachers are not using some of the skills that they could be using. It is a shame that all those pagans are such good speakers, and our preachers are well, he's very honest, they are putting people to sleep. Those are his words, not mine. So what did he do? He tried to bring these two together, these two strains of Athens, Jerusalem, and Athens, the sense of being inspired by God's word, but also putting that perspiration in, learning how does one teach 
and delight and move? How does one learn how to interpret the scriptures and interpret the situation? How does one choose the words that will match a particular community? He was a man of his time. How do we speak to our time, to congregations that are filled with, uh, as I said, almost Christians, or a world in which their people are now what we call SBNR, spiritual but not religious, and people who are rejecting religious institutions. Should we throw out rhetoric? Should we do, as my young student said, just show film clap clips? I don't think so. I think that the insights of Aristotle and Cicero and Augustine continue to teach us how to craft our messages. But I think we need to draw on some of the other people who are writing today. I would in part turn to Sonia and Karen Foss and Karen Foss, who have uh, talked about a way of rethinking rhetoric for our world, a world of, of differences. They, they begin by talking about the four primary modes of rhetoric. Conquest rhetoric, in which if you win, your listener loses and your view prevails. Conversion rhetoric, not to win, but to convince and change. Benevolent rhetoric, a change out of concern for the well-being uh, uh, of the other and advisory rhetoric when someone comes to you and asks for a request. They, uh, they suggest one more and that is invitational rhetoric which is beyond persuasion. Invitational rhetoric, they say, is an invitation to the audience to enter the rhetor's world and to see the world as the speaker sees the world to see the world and to consider your perspective seriously. The object, they write, of invitational rhetoric is to understand and is reached as communicators engage in a sharing of worlds through word, words. The goal is not to win or prove superiority, but to clarify ideas to achieve understanding for all participants involved in the interaction, to speak the speaker and the audience jointly consider and contribute to thinking about an issue so that everyone involved gains a greater understanding of the subtlety, the richness, and complexity of the issue. And they, their idea of invitational rhetoric is based on several assumptions. The purpose is understanding, not to win, not conquest. You know, in, in the ancient rhetoric, the word for arrangement in Latin actually was the same word for arraying your armies. But they say that the purpose is understanding and that the, each, the speaker and the listeners are to listen with openness and the speaker and the listeners can be viewed as equals. It is power with rather than power over the participants change only when they choose to change. The participants are enter willing to be changed, which I think the studies have showed, and I'm going to come back to some other studies as well. It creates a world of appreciation for difference. Now, they argue that this invitational rhetoric is just one of many in your rhetorical toolbox, but it could be another way of speaking to our changing world. I think it's very close to what Hans Georg Gadamer talks about in Truth and Method, this fusion of horizons. He writes, in the process of understanding, a real fusing of horizons occurs, which means that as the historical horizon is projected, it is simultaneously superseded. This 
fusion is in a way a, is the task in which we are called historically effective consciousness, a fusing of horizons. And I wonder if this approach of invitational rhetoric, of, of conversation, does this really approach the understanding of homily? Because homily is from homilia, conversation. I'd also turn to the work of Lori Correll, who teaches at the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh. She has a new book coming out from the Alban Institute called Preaching That Matters, Reflective Practices for Transforming Sermons, but it grows out of a decade-long studies that she has done, and those are collected in a great book from about 10 years ago called The Great American Sermon Survey. She's been, over the past 10 years, working with the Lilly Endowment and the Center for Excellence in Congregational Leadership. And she wants preachers to know that the sermon is a unique public speaking event. And in her survey, which was 479 listeners, Catholic and Protestant all across the country, and 102 preachers, she said, just what Ron Allen and their group found, people listen. People want to hear the sermon. And this is what she writes. Pastors and listeners expect preaching to lead to change. We ex listen expecting inspiration. We look to preaching expecting spiritual leadership. We rely on preaching for spiritual content. We listen expecting long-lasting impact. And she wants preachers to hear that. Believe the potential power of your preaching. And she has come to understand that a real problem with preaching is that preachers don't believe in that transforming power. They don't think that what they're doing matters and makes a difference. And she wants you to know that it does. And she says successful sermons ask for change. Successful sermons ask for change. Go and tell. You have been called to tell. Your preaching is crucial for the life of the church and the lives of your people. And that you can work and learn and change and deepen your preaching. And a lot of that, those of you who are coming tomorrow, those are some of the things we're going to be talking about tomorrow. In closing, I would like to turn your attention to your feet. In a moment, you're going to stand up and walk out on those feet. But before we do, I want to remind you how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, announces salvation, and who says to Zion, your God reigns. I think that, that feet is what Peter was looking at as he spoke with the risen Christ by the Sea of Tiberias. Christ's feet and his own. In those last tumultuous, fearful, agonizing days, he had been watching feet. He watched as their friend Mary poured fragrant, expensive perfume all over Jesus' feet. He watched as she unbound and wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. He watched Jesus get up from the table as they ate supper before the Passover, and Jesus knelt and washed all those ugly, dirty feet. You will never wash my feet, Peter declared. Unless I wash you, Jesus said, unless I wash you, you will have no share of me. 
And Peter watched as the soldiers pounded the nails into Jesus' feet. And now Peter stood before Jesus, staring at the holes in those feet that only a few days had hung on the cross. And what went through his mind as he stared at his own feet, covered with sand at the lake shore? I suspect he stared at his feet, ashamed and embarrassed and humiliated and mortified. And he looked and wished that he was standing not on sand, but quicksand. Could he just disappear? Then came those questions. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Then feed my sheep. Feet. Big, little, smooth, rough. The scriptures are filled with the feet of those who answered God's call, the call to feed and tend the sheep. Moses, Aaron, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Mary, Augustine. And I want to remind you that we are called, like Moses, to take off our sandals because we are on holy ground. And then when we put those sandals back on, we are go put them on in order to stand with the oppressed, with those who are seeking freedom. And it is about getting to one's feet to proclaim to the people God's word. All of us who love the creator, love the risen Christ, love the spirit our advocate have been called and we are being sent each and every day to tend and feed the sheep of God's flock. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you. Thank you.